people who follow this every single day, I don't think they're aware of this kind of change in, in thinking of, of ETH2. So yeah, can you kind of explain um, how, how that uh, shift happened? Sure. Uh, so I think it's important to remember that like, the ETH2 roadmap has something that has changed quite a bit over the last few years. So I think the vision around three to four years ago actually was to just make a, a new chain that would change a lot of things that would fix all of the mistakes in the existing Ethereum system and then add proof of stake, add sharding, and finally come up with some kind of way for existing applications to move over. And I think the roadmap has like evolved to become more pragmatic over time in um, a lot of ways. Uh, so especially as the merge has come closer, there have been a lot of these um, subtle changes toward emphasizing just making it a very smooth transition for developers. Um, so just like as one example, right, like in the roadmap as it was in 2018, like it would have probably required um, individual application and developers or just individual users to take their assets and move it over from the ETH1 chain to the ETH2 chain. But now, like, there isn't even moving from chain to chain happening, right? Like, the, the two chains are even merging together. And the thing that we call the ETH1 chain today, like, that's being renamed the execution chain, right? And the thing called the uh, beacon chain, it's like uh, being renamed uh, the consensus chain. And these are not going to be two separate chains, right? Right now, there's two separate chains, but after the merge, the execution chain is going to live inside of the uh, consensus chain, right? So every beacon chain block will contain one execution chain block. And so, you know, you'll literally have a chain inside a chain. Um, and the reason why we did this is to just make the merge process as uh, simple as possible and as uh, smooth as possible for users, for client developers, and for uh, contract and uh, application developers, right? Because your experience of Ethereum as a user is not even going to change all that much between uh, before the merge and after the merge. Like you download the software and uh, your experience uh, you know, just interacting with Ethereum, the Ethereum chain looks very similar before and after. The only difference is that before, the uh, Ethereum execution blocks had some proof of work attached, and after, these uh, Ethereum execution blocks will not have any proof of work attached anymore, but instead they'll come packaged inside these uh, beacon chain blocks. Uh, so, like, there's a lot of complicated technical wizardry happening in the background, but, you know, from the point of view as a user, you don't even have to worry about that as much, right? And so like, there's a lot of continuity between Ethereum before and Ethereum after. It's not a replacement. It's actually a fairly small, slow and incremental uh, kind of upgrade uh, where basically the entire ecosystem is, uh, is being sort of taken from um, running on top of this older proof of work design to running on top of this and newer and very powerful proof of stake design. And then with the ability to add sharding and um, other lovely things on top. Um, so, you know, basically, like, post-merge Ethereum is Ethereum, right? Like, there isn't this sort of, like, you know, you have 1.0 ETH and 2.0 ETH. There isn't this kind of, like, you have a 1.0 ecosystem and a 2.0 ecosystem. It just is the Ethereum ecosystem and always will be the Ethereum ecosystem. I mean, from the point of view of a user, like, I'm, like, phew, like, that sounds so much simpler to not have to transfer assets, to not have to worry about like two different ETHs. Um, mm -hmm. And will will this new uh, proof of stake chain hold the transaction history of the old proof of work chain? So that's um, the one thing that it will not, right? So basically transaction history before the merge, it will still be in this proof of work chain. And at some point, like Ethereum uh, clients are just going to kind of delete the old code and they're not going to speak the old language anymore. And people are going to have to kind of create, either use old nodes or create special purpose protocols to, to handle really old data. Um, so that like, I think that's just a kind of necessary technical decision, right? Because we're like, we are trading off some, a couple of different factors, right? Like on the one hand, we do, we definitely do not want Ethereum nodes to just continue becoming more unwieldy and more complex to build and run over time. 
right? And so if you don't want that, then like the only way to do that is to forget old things, right? To forget like old, older transactions, older uh, protocol rules, and like have the newer versions of the software focus on uh, just being able to process the chain as it is today and say as it was in the last like say year or two. Um, but if you still want to go in and look at things that happened before, like you will be able to, right? And there's already third party protocols, like for example, the graph is one thing that people are starting to use to look up history more efficiently. So there are going to be a lot of ways to do that if you still uh, just need to access uh, hi history for whatever reason. But it's just sort of being taken out of the scope of like the things that you that a node has to do in order to be an Ethereum node that's part of the network. That's that's really interesting. I, I wonder if if there's kind of um, I don't know like uh, analysis there to to make to be made on um, just um, the immutability um, aspect of Ethereum. The fact that now. Sure, like you, you have like all the previous transaction history somewhere else, but because it's not part of the like the the chain at the moment, I mean, can can one argument be made that oh, like Ethereum isn't as immutable because that was erased? I don't think it should. It would compromise immutability, right? Because like the hash chain is still there, right? If you want to go audit it, like you can still check that you know every block had a hash of the previous block, and then you look up the previous block, and then that block has a hash of its own previous block, and you keep looking it up. Like there's no way whatsoever that an attacker would be able to like give you fake old blocks and convince you that they're real old blocks because like for every one of these old blocks. If they're real, you would be able to come up with a proof. And if they're fake, like there's no way the attacker can make a proof. Mm -hmm. um, it is definitely like there is, I think, a real uh, kind of cultural difference in expectations versus like something like Bitcoin, for example, right? Like where in the case of like the Bitcoin ecosystem, they really value this idea that you with a present day Bitcoin node can just go and uh, validate every single thing that happened from day one. And in the case of Ethereum, like that's not really true, right? And if you actually want to go personally check that everything is fine, then like at some point you would have to like, you know, go back into history, use an older version of the Ethereum clients to, tell, to check the older part of the chain, then use a newer version to check the newer part of the chain. And like, that is definitely a bit, a somewhat different a kind of relationship between the community and the chain and like that fact that's true in other ways as well right so like for example with proof of stake like we talk about weak subjectivity and how like one of the trade-offs of proof of stake is that to get the full security guarantees you do like there is some uh, kind of like minimum frequency like you, you have to uh, kind of log on at least once every certain number of uh, weeks weeks or months um and that's also something that proof of work does not have right so like <laughs> There's definitely trade-offs being made. I mean, obviously, the fact that we're doing this means that we think that the benefits are much uh, are much higher than the costs. Um, but you know, the trade-offs do exist as well, and that's fine.